you stand as we come into the presence of the one and only that we have come today to worship. I never, ever want to take for granted the opportunity that we have to come in our freedom and to worship the King of Kings. Would you join us?
Good morning. Have a seat real quick, please. Guys, it's good to see you back. We wel welcome you in the name of the Lord. We pray the Lord's blessings on you as we gather for worship today. It's good to, good to see you and good to see some new faces in here with us as well. We are exci I'm excited in just a few moments to introduce a couple to you. Uh, we have a, a couple that's been a part of our church for a long time. They were on staff here about 20 plus years ago and went off to be missionaries. And they went to Thailand and served in Thailand for a bit. And then the Lord kind of called them to another place. And you're going to hear an interesting story from Mark and Kim Wyatt here in just a few minutes and had the pleasure of meeting them just a little bit ago. Many of you might know them in their, in their past with yeah. us. One other thing I'd like to share with you real quick, our, our homeless shelter is fully engaged for the next three to five days and uh, they need some help in the evening shift. And if you're interested in plugging in and being a part of that, send me an email and I'll get you in touch with the people that you need to help out with. But we have a, a lot of people who are taking advantage of our homeless shelter right now, but we need some folks in the evening time Time. And if you are interested in that, send me an email and we'll get the, get the information to where we need it to get to. Two last things. Sorry, I just said last thing a minute ago, but I just remembered something. Two weeks from now is going to be my favorite Sunday of the year. That's what we call the taste of heaven. And that's when we gather together and we invite all of our congregations that worship here. The four language groups are going to be with us. Our Spanish congregation, the Korean congregation, the Vietnamese, and the Arabic congregation. And we are going to come together in this room at 1030. So that's 30 minutes earlier than normal. So please make note of that. And we will come in together and we're going to celebrate the beauty of how we come together as the body of Christ from so many different places that worship in this one spot. And following worship, we're going to break bread together. So we invite you to bring a covered dish, something to share. I try to tell people, if you're from Mexico, bring something from Mexico. If you're from Louisiana, bring something from Louisiana. Wherever it is you're from, bring something that we can share, that we can break bread around tables together and take, do something very significant for the community of faith in the body of Christ that meets in this place. Last thing, and it really, really is the last thing. If you're a part, if you're new to our congregation, we have a Meet the Team event. We'd love to introduce you, have lunch with you right after worship today. And we do that in Rock Stadium down the hallway, and we'd love to invite you to be a part of that. Just join us, and we have, we'll have food and the time to be with you. Now, let's take some time and pray. Father, it's good to be in your house today. We are grateful, Father, that your Holy Spirit is here in this place, that your Spirit is, is already speaking to our hearts and our minds and our souls. Father, sometimes you draw us to these places and you give us a word of encouragement. You give us a word of support. Sometimes you draw us to this place and you, you speak to our hearts where we need to change and we need to repent and we need to go in a new direction. Father, sometimes you draw us to this place and our spirits are lifted by the grace and the mercy that you provide. Father, we are grateful that however we come, however we arrive, you know exactly what needs to be said to our soul. And your spirit speaks and your spirit draws us close and your spirit helps us to be drawn closer to you. So Father, whatever's on our table, whatever's on our mind, whatever's on our plate, whatever we're struggling with, Father, we just want to give that to you now. And we want to ask God that you fill us you encourage us. You draw us closer to you. Father, we know there's some heartache in this room, that there's some marriages that are struggling. There's some work stuff going on that just stinks. We know there's some stuff going on nationally that's just hard for us. But Father, we are yours, and we are your people, and we are a family that meets here. Speak to us. Hold us together. And we know, Father, there are others in this room that are going through hard days that we just don't know their names. But Father, just be with them. Give them the strength they need to walk through some dark valleys. Give them the hope that they need to, keep, to take the next step forward. Father, just walk with us as we walk with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to read something that our pastor put on Facebook this week. And I want to read it because I want to make sure that this congregation knows what kind of church we are and what we're going to stand for. He said, I'm grateful to be in a church that welcomes people from countries all over the world. 54 nations are represented in our congregation. We are richer, a richer nation because of the incredibly diverse people that call the U.S. home. Our worship songs say all creatures, all the nations. And so we want 
to take a stand as this congregation to say, you're welcome. And we want you to know that our doors are open and the doors to your friends are open. And we want to be a congregation that stands on the word of God that says all are welcome. He created us all. He created us all equal and he loves us all. And we are going to stand. And now you're going to stand and we're going to sing about it.
Amen. Have a seat. It's my privilege to introduce to you a couple that uh, was a part of this church uh, for a couple for three years and back in the 90s, and they served here and were commissioned here to go as missionaries to Thailand. And uh, they served in Thailand uh, for a number of years, and then uh, they felt a calling to go on to another mission field. So before I, before I do that, uh, get into that story, I, I wanted you to kind of introduce yourselves and maybe tell us a little bit about where you're from and where you grew up, and just real quick, if you could do that. Uh, well, I'd just like to say, Pastor, first that when we were here, the, the vision, the call to be in this space right now was being discerned. And look at you. Mm -hmm. Look at this. I'm, we're so proud of you. Look what you've done. And 54 nations represented in your congregation. We just praise God for the good work of this church and what you've been, the light you've been, the salt you've been. So excuse me for not answering your question. That's okay. That's okay. Our son, John Mark, was born in the hospital. Our son is a Manassan. Is that how you say it? <laughs> so we're at home. We're glad what you're here. My, 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 question, my question is this. Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your backstory yeah. and, and what led yeah. you to um, where you are now. We, uh, we grew up in a typical home that uh, loved their neighbor, mm -hmm. uh, everyone took us to church and told us the Bible was true and we should read it and follow it. And we grew up actually where there weren't a lot of folks that were different from us, but we knew they were out there. And as we grew in our faith and our experiences, we started to discover the diversity, this beautiful mosaic of God's world and that God, as Terry said, loves the whole world, not just the ones that look like us. And as we grew in that knowledge of God's world, we started to understand not everyone was hearing this message. In fact, unless someone goes to those, they may not ever hear. And how could that be? That's just not right and fair. And so our, our sense of being raised in home and then sent out, we've had all these years we've been looking to help others find home. And many times as we've been on this journey, we've not been at home. Now, tell me this real quick, Mark. Yeah. When you left Manassas, you all went. Where'd you go? Can you tell us a little bit about where you went? So, yes, so we went to Thailand, and you all prayed for us. We were with the Rock people, an unreached people group that had not heard. They actually didn't acknowledge the existence of God. And we thought that we would spend about 35 years there. But instead, we found ourselves back in North America two years later and in the great white north in Canada where we never, ever imagined when I was that little 17-year-old and heard God's call to be a missionary, I never imagined it would be in North America. But we did, we had a change that happened to us. As we were engaging refugees in North America, we realized that it wasn't about a place, the uttermost parts of the earth, but it was about the people from those places. And so, strangely enough, we spent 15 years in Canada serving among refugees and other internationals. And then three years ago, we were called back to our own home state of North Carolina to serve among the international refugee population there. And don't you know, we actually now live back in my hometown. <laughs> Strange but true. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> God calls us in the Great Commission, to go ye therefore into all the nations and to preach the gospel. And yet the nations arrived in your community in North Carolina, and you've had the opportunity to make an impact there. What are some of the things that you're doing? We watched the video clip, but what are some of the practical things that you're doing to, to impact the community? That well, you're obviously with? when someone comes and they are starting from zero, then there's a lot that needs to happen for them to become self-sustained people. And our work as missionaries is the whole gospel, the whole person. And so we're, we're being neighbor. We're helping folks find the things they need and meet the places and, and their children start school and jobs and all of the things that help a, a family become self-sufficient. We think the best way to serve in the Bible Belt as missionaries is to help people become responsible for themselves and not do for them things they can do for themselves, but coach them there. And as a part of that, we get this trusted friendship. We are Uncle Mark and Aunt Kim. Sometimes I'm Aunt Mark, and she's Uncle Kim because we're learning English too, right? Yeah. But we're, that family connection is so deep. In fact, Pastor, I don't think any of my family are here other than my church family. 
we feel closer sometimes to those we serve that we've welcomed than to our own families. Wow. Now, you've heard us mention, you heard Terry mention that we have representatives from 54 nations in our congregation. This is your calling. This is your profession to serve the new arrivals. How might we, how might those of us who are born in Manassas or born in Nebraska or born in Oklahoma or born in Beaumont, Texas, how might we love the nations that are our neighbors? Well, uh, Kim is going to speak to that specifically, but I want to say it's an unprecedented time, Pastor, in our country as a nation, like never before in our memory, we've asked many older than ourselves if they can recall a time when so much focus has been on ourselves as a country of immigrants. Right now, while there may be a great dialogue and a discussion and disagreement out in the world, what we're seeing is an unprecedented time of opportunity and a door open to those peoples who are new to our country. And God's people are responding like we have never seen before. We used to pray and hope, Lord, could the churches in North America embrace their international neighbor like they are in other countries? And look at what's happening. And it's building. It's not slowing. Something wonderful is happening. Jesus is returning. And before he returns, the nations are responding and God's people are welcoming them. Very cool. You're going to have to repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will just tell you this, Kim. While your husband was speaking, I was looking at Josh. I was looking at Sifa. I was looking at mm. Cody, mm -hmm. and I was looking at Angela, and I'm looking at some students mm -hmm. who are going to New York City and working with Chinese immigrants in New York, yes. and other kids who are going to Guatemala and building houses and doing things. What can we say to them yes. about loving their neighbors who are from other places here? Yes, well, right here, what I say is what I think our youth and our children do well, they don't think about it. It is live life together. So for the adults, I say, Invite one another over to your homes. Know one another. It's in that connection. It's not just in sitting and rubbing shoulders while you're in here, but it's living life together. And as I've heard that you do, it's interviewing your own people, asking what was their experience in coming to the United States? And what is it they wish or would like for us as the body of Christ to know that would really be helpful to them? I think that's, those are a couple of the biggest things. And Pastor, I just want to add that as we go out on mission and serve in other places where we're guests, where we're the visitors, Let's take that experience, that formation of Christian discipleship, and let's bring that back. And if we're serving among Chinese Americans in New York, wow, let's know the Chinese Americans that are our neighbor, that live around our house, that go to our school. Let's, let's don't see mission as something that happens and it's over, but it's a formation of who we are as God's people, to be on mission always, to be that welcoming presence, that neighbor. It's so core to the message of the Bible from beginning to end that God's called us to love our neighbors as ourselves. I want to tell them thank you for coming, and I'm going to, we've been supporting them financially for a long time and supporting them in their work, but we're going to support them with prayer in just a moment. You watched the video and saw the impact they had with the Afghani refugee. I want you to know that there is an Afghani general that attends our church who uh, was assistant to the Allied to American Forces in Afghanistan, and he and his wife were brought over to the States after the conflict, but his extended family wasn't, and his extended family is now being targeted in Afghanistan. And almost every Tuesday or Thursday when they arrive at our ESOL program, they are weeping and praying and crying out for help. So not only can we watch things that they are doing, we can be a part of the prayerful support of helping an, an Afghani family even here. But I want to pray for Mark and Kim and just thank God for their work and their ministry. And then we're going to ask a blessing on the offering as well. And then uh, we're going to have a time to hear from young Madeline who's going to present a song. Father, we are grateful for the work and the ministry that is done by this couple. We're thankful, Father, for Aunt Kim and Uncle Mark for the work that they do as they care for people who are newly arriving to this, this country. Thank you, Father, that they are building bridges with people who have never heard of Jesus and have no connection with Christ. And we pray that they would have the strength that they need to continue this work and that they would see the fruit of your spirit being born out as they love one another, as they love others, as they care for people in the name of Jesus. Father, may they be an inspiration to us in Northern Virginia as we seek to do the same as we care for our neighbors in our community. Father, thank you 
that we have a congregation that is desirous of, of going to places like New York City or Guatemala or wherever. And I'm thankful, Father, we have a church that welcomes people into this community of faith. Help us, Father, to be a lighthouse of grace and mercy for a, a tumultuous time that we live, that we might be agents of grace and mercy here. Father, in just a moment, we're going to be taking up an offering. And this offering goes to support work like Kim and Mark are a part of. It goes to support work like the, the warming shelter that people desperately need. It goes to support work like our ESOL program and the mission programs that we do in Manassas. Help us, Father, to be faithful stewards in giving and supporting the work that you have before us as we go forward and follow you in obedience now. Thank you, Father, for this couple, for their ministry in Manassas for three years and for their ministry in, in, in Thailand, in Canada, and now back home in North Carolina. Walk with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. done, Kim and Madeline. Appreciate that very much. I love that we have students participating in our worship. Today, our drummer was Ashley back there, and it's nice to have Madeline leading in worship as well. So that's good stuff. 
All right, guys, Terry told me that I'm a little bit over, or he's a little bit over time, so I apologize. I'm going to have to ramp up my speed, so if you don't speak English, it's going to be tough to follow me today, and I'm going to cut down some things. But I do have Norm and Mike and some others going to pass something out. Norm and Mike, if you would make your way down and, and pass these things out, if you don't mind. Last Sunday, I passed out these yellow cards, and they are the a block where I'm asking people who were here last Sunday to take these and fill these out, if you would. If you were not here, would you raise your hand so we can get these to you? If you you did not receive one, raise your hand so we can pass these out. What I'm asking you to do for, the, for this year, for this year, keep your hand up so they can pass them out to you. One per family, if you would. What I'm asking you to do for this year is that you fill this out over the next several weeks and you mark on those blocks the names of your eight closest neighbors. Now, last Sunday, I asked people to take five minutes during my message to fill this out. And if, and if you knew all eight, that was awesome. But there was less than about 10% of the people knew all eight. The vast majority of people who filled that out knew three or four. In fact, when you start filling these out, sometimes people call these the block of shame because we just don't know the people around us. After you fill this out with the names of the people that live closest to you, I'm going to ask you if you'll keep it on your refrigerator. You'll keep this block on your refrigerator for the rest of this year, and it will be a reminder for you to pray for your neighbors. Many of us understand we're supposed to love our neighbor. But I want to say that it's very hard to love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor's name. And so I'm going to encourage you over the course of the next several weeks to be intentional about getting to know the name of your neighbor. It's very important in our story. With that, with that being said, I just want you to be aware of what's going on. Now, when I say to you that, that it is important for us to know our neighbor and to fill these things out, I, I, I know the first thing that you're going to think about is, David, if I fill this out and I start learning my neighbor's name, what do you want me to do with that? How do you want me to respond with that information? What's the next step after getting that information filled out on that block? Well, the thing that we're challenging you to do is, is to build a relationship where you can be somewhat of a blessing. And as you think about that in Northern Virginia, with the crazy schedule that we keep, with the hours that we sit in traffic on 66, with the busy lives that we lead here, and you hear the preacher say, I want you to build more relationships in your mind, whether you verbalized it or not. Maybe you told your spouse when you went home, that dude's crazy because I don't have time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the emotional bandwidth. It's not going to happen. And the question we start asking ourselves is how in the world are we going to have more time to develop relationships? And we start thinking about this and we start processing that, that question of how are we going to do that? And, and as we start thinking about these things, we recognize that we lead some busy lives. And sorry, I'm just scrolling through there because I'm not going to have any way of getting all my message through today. So I'm trying to give you the highlights in this, quick, in this really quick. When we think about the, the pace of life that we, we live, we live some crazy busy times. We drive hours in traffic. Many of us are in the car. How many, just for a show of hands, how many of you spend 30 minutes or more in traffic every day? Raise your hand, 30 minutes or more. Would you, everybody just look around real quick? If you spend more than an hour in traffic, would you raise your hand? More than an hour, raise your hand. You folks spend a lot of time. Now, is there anybody that spends more than 90 minutes? Raise your hand. Oh, that's heartbreaking. That's a lot of time you're spending. Is there anybody that spends more than two hours a day in traffic? There you go. Friends, when you start talking about a topic like this and there are people in this room who spend that much time just getting to and from work, it's just, it's tough. And when you hear the pastor saying to you, friends, it's important to love your neighbor, and then that sometimes can have a sense of guilt, or you can just totally check out and think, I'm, I'm not even going to pretend to engage in this. But the reality is, if we're going to think about and consider what the Bible says as something important, in Galatians chapter 6, in Galatians chapter 5, we hear what the Bible says very clearly, that loving your neighbors yourself, that's kind of a mandate that we see from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and all in between, we see this message of loving our neighbor so we understand this is pretty significant and very important and we also understand according to the book of Acts in Acts chapter 17 that it seems that God has placed us in our neighborhoods for a reason and a purpose 
And then we look at this place where the scripture says that he determined the time set for them and the exact places. Then perhaps God has something for us to do in our neighborhood, in with the people that live around us and the people that live most closely to us. And this mindset is one that I, I think we might need to consider. Now, think about this for a second. Jesus did his ministry basically in three years. He equipped 12 people to change the world. He taught thousands of people his story. He did some pretty miraculous things. He spoke to political leadership, and he did it all in a three-year time frame. Jesus, on many occasions, would be with the masses of people. Then he would be with a select few. Then he might be with one or two or three. And then there are other times that Jesus would just peel away and get away from everybody and spend some focused time alone thinking about his connection with the Father and engaging in that capacity. Jesus didn't drive. He didn't get in an airplane to fly. He didn't text. He didn't send an email. Jesus did this in a little bit of a slower pace than we have. When you think of Jesus, do you ever hear the word hurry? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see Jesus as in a hurry. I see him at a nice steady pace going about his business. There's a fellow by the name of John Wartburg, famous author. He said it this way, love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time. And the time is the one thing that hurried people don't have. Let me read that again. Love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time. And time is the one thing that hurried people don't have. And as we think about this picture of loving our neighbor, one of the things that it's going to take is some dedicated time in how that happens. Now, when I hold up that, has anybody got one of those cards close by that they can throw me real quick or bring me? Bring it up here, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. I'll give this back to you in a minute. When I look at my card, I, I wish I could tell you I've got all eight. I don't. I have three. I have three. It's a process, and it's a process that takes time. And I, I wish I could tell you that I got those three last week. I didn't get a single one last week. In fact, I didn't even try last week. It was too cold to talk to my neighbors last week. You know what I'm saying? I'll save that for, Jan for July or June. No, I'm kidding about that. I've been focusing on this for several months. This has been something that I've been thinking about and processing for a while. And guys, it's not easy. That's why I'm asking you to put it on your refrigerator for a year and be intentional about it for a year and make it a process where we are being intentional to develop some relationships in that capacity and that we can make an impact in that regard. Why is this important to, seg to schedule some time and make this happen? Well, there's a great story that Jesus engages us with in the Gospel of Luke. If you've got your Bible, I invite you to open it up to Luke chapter 10. In verse 38, the Bible says this story as they were traveling to along, Jesus, he went into a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him to her home and she had a sister named Mary and Mary, she sat at the Lord's feet and she listened to him talk, but, but Martha, but Martha was upset about all the work she had to do and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you worry and you fuss about a lot of things. And there's only one thing you need. Mary has made the right choice. And that one thing will not be taken away from her. This story is about Jesus who is going to the house of some friends that he spends a lot of time with. He's comfortable there. He enjoys being with them. He enjoys the time that he has with these sisters. You have friends like this. You have friends that when you go to their house, you can sit down in somebody's television chair and turn on the television because you're comfortable with them. You love the conversations that you have. You love the food that you share together. You enjoy being in that house. And you also go to some homes where you're afraid to touch anything because it's a museum. And you're afraid to talk about certain topics because you don't know how somebody's going to talk. And you're afraid to address other things because it's just a little bit tense in that place. This place is, is safe and it's comfortable. And Jesus, he's ready. He's ready to relax and to chill out. He's ready to talk to his disciples. And he's ready to enjoy some good food. Martha, she's decorated. 
She's cleaned. She's cooked. She's got everything ready. Mary's probably helped her out along the way. But it's that Jesus is in the house and the disciples are there and other people are there. Martha's going from this place to that place. She's working on the pita bread. She's fixing the hummus. She's getting the vegetables ready. She's making some tzatziki sauce. Man, if Jesus is lucky, she's making some kunafe and they're getting ready to have a great lunch. And as Martha's doing all that, she keeps looking over and her sister who's supposed to be there, her sister's supposed to be helping, her sister who's supposed to be a part of this story, she is sitting, sitting down at Jesus' feet and she's not saying a word and not doing anything. And Martha... She's not happy. And, and you know, I don't know how long most of you guys have been married, but there's a time when I can understand when my wife's mad and she doesn't have to say a word. Has that ever happened to anybody? Uh, no, Sonny, don't raise your hand. Sonny, don't raise your hand. Come on, man. There's a time when, when our spouse is upset at us, when we are upset with our spouse, that we don't have to say a word and they know we're upset. All we see is Martha saying to Jesus, tell my sister to get up. And Jesus says to her, Martha, you're fussing about a lot of stuff. Now, Martha might not have said any other word. But you could hear the feet stomping in the kitchen. And you could hear the dishes slamming a little bit harder. And you could see her looking over at her sister and getting a little bit angry. And her face getting a little bit redder. You could see that she was getting upset. And Jesus said, Martha, you're fussing. You're just fussing too much. Because Mary, Mary's chosen the right thing. Now, think about that for a second. Could you imagine the privilege, the opportunity of what it would have been to serve Jesus a meal? How awesome that opportunity would have been. I mean, that's a significant, huge moment. I mean, that's incredible. And yet, Mary is just seated, seated at his feet, listening. In that culture, women didn't have a chance to sit at the feet of a teacher. Women didn't have the chance to learn from a rabbi. Women weren't given the privilege to, to learn in this kind of capacity. So this is kind of a, this is a stretch for Mary just to have that opportunity to sit there. And Jesus says to Martha, Martha, you have chosen the wrong thing. Mary, she's sitting down, she's listening, she's hanging out in this capacity. Mary is taking the time that she needs to learn. And I want to say to you and to us, to me, as people who are busy, who have demands on our time, there's a time and an opportunity that we need to pause for just a bit and hear what's going on around us and to see the needs that are there and talk and to listen in that capacity. I uh, was talking with a Bible study group on Wednesday night, and there's a lady in our congregation. She, she uh, lives by herself in a in a house that's kind of surrounded by some apartments. And so she doesn't have any single dwelling homes, but she's got some apartments that are right beside her home. And, and, and so when I asked her, I said, do you have any neighbors? And she said, David, I really don't have any neighbors because they're several blocks away. I have to walk over to see my neighbors. But she said, I found when I'm walking and seeing my neighbors, a lot of my neighbors who are new arrivals to our country, they love to talk. And so I just start talking with them. And one day I was outside and I was picking up my mail and one of my neighbors who, she said, I don't even know where she was from. She came over and she started talking to me at the mailbox. And we talked for so long at the mailbox, my legs got tired and I had to go inside and sit down. And she came in the house and she sat down with me for two more hours. And after a little bit of time, the door knocks and her son's at the door. And he says, Mama, I thought you were here. Dad's worried. You haven't called him back in two hours and he didn't know where you were. And we've been looking all over, but I thought maybe you might be at our neighbor's house. And she said, oh yeah, I'm fine. I've just been sitting here talking and da-da-da-da-da. And they took off and left. And she'd built a relationship that two hours later... She was still there. Now, I know most of us can't do that. Most of us aren't retired in that capacity, but there's kind of a bridge that was built right there that was pretty substantial. Another member of our congregation sent me an email, and she wrote this. Kimmy wrote this. She said, your sermon got me thinking about my neighbors. In my neighborhood, I, I don't speak Spanish, and most of the people do. It's different to talk to them because I can barely communicate, and they barely speak any English. But we still find ways to get to know each other. We wave, we smile, we practice our broken English, our broken Spanish with each other. And we may not know each other by name, but we know that an emergency will be there. Now, this is not to say that I, I don't know any of my neighbor's names, but in a neighborhood as diverse as mine, you can still find a way to be a blessing to them and for them to be a blessing to you. When we look at the schedules we keep, at the busy pace that we have in life, and we think about what it means to be a neighbor... Three questions, and I close. Three questions that I want you to pray. Three thoughts that I want you to engage. 
And this is it. When you think about what your role might be in the art of neighboring, maybe your first prayer, your first prayer is, God, what's your heart for me? What do you want me to do in my neighborhood? Second, what's the next step that you desire that I take? What's the next step that you want me to take in my neighborhood? And three, how do you want me to focus on loving my neighbors? How do you want me to do that? You see, I, I, I have to believe that if we understand that Jesus said loving our neighbors is one of the two main commands he gives us, and if we're going to believe that the book of Acts tells us that we have been assigned a place, that we've been given a place to make a difference, then, then maybe this whole piece about loving our neighbors is kind of important. And if it's kind of important, maybe we need to ask God. Say, God, what's your heart for me? What's the next step that you want me to take? How do you want me to focus on loving my neighbor? How does that, what does that look like? And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, the first step might be finding a name and praying for that name, praying for that person, building just a little bit of a relationship that if you know there's a crisis going on, that you don't just say, nod your head and move along, but you can actually pray for that person and maybe provide some assistance to that person. I don't know. But my guess is that if we want to take this idea of loving our neighbor serious the way Jesus seems to think it is important, then maybe hanging this on our refrigerator for a year and praying for our neighbors and building some relationships in an intentional manner might be important. Is that something that you can do? Is that a step that you can take? I'm fascinated to hear some of you say, that you know all the neighbors that you've known. And that's, that's pretty amazing to me. I'm struggling on this. And I'm a pretty outgoing guy. But sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge. But I'm making a commitment to take this step of neighboring, of loving my neighbor. What's your step going to be? Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we think about your word today, we have heard from two of your servants who have literally changed the course and the trajectory of their life to answer your call. Father, they moved to Thailand to share your story. And then they moved to Canada to share your story. And now you've brought them to their hometown to share your story with new arrivals. Father, your word, it seems to indicate from the beginning to the very end that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Father, you have used your son Jesus to teach this over and over and over again. And Lord, maybe part of your plan for making a difference in our communities is that the people represented in this room would begin a process of loving those who live closest to them. And Lord, I wish I knew what that looked like. I wish I knew what that looked like for every person in this room, but I don't. You do. And it's a part of our faith journey to take the steps of faith. So Lord, my prayer today for those who are listening is that we'll be genuine and we'll honestly ask you, what is your heart for me in this process? That we'll ask you, what's the next step you want me to take in this process? That we'll be honest and we'll ask you, how do you want me to focus on loving my neighbor in my dorm at college, in my, in my school, in where, wherever it is, Father, that you might speak to us about loving our neighbor where we live. Father, help us to take this, this mandate, this command serious, and we'll see together what it looks like as we advance your kingdom, literally, all around this community. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our praise